I'm a professor in urban planning, and my speciality is uh, the relation between infrastructure planning and urban planning. That is how these two concepts can be related in smart ways. Uh, and the claim I would like to make is that when we build infrastructure, this will always have, nearly always, have a very, very significant uh, uh, impact on the built environment. And this impact could be a negative impact, very obvious pollution and, and noise, but it could also be a positive impact. And that could, for example, be that areas that are remote, housing districts or what other kind of areas, that had been remote are now more accessible due to the infrastructure. There are three things that I would like to use as starting points for discussing infrastructure development. Uh, and the three facts, or th the three conditions that I would like to start with raising is firstly that infrastructure plays a significant role for the functioning of our society. And if we look at our travel behaviors, compare them in time, we can see that we are increasingly dependent on travel and the change from, if we could call it, the old industrial society and the society we're living in today is tremendous, both in terms of the number of travels and the distance we travel. Uh, second thing is that urbanization, which is a global phenomena, very obvious in Stockholm, as you heard from Rigert's presentation. This causes two types of, of uh, consequences. The first one is, of course, congestion, and the other, other consequence is the demand for more infrastructure. Thirdly, we have a number of challenges which I think we have to take on board. Uh, the first one, which is obvious, and you touched upon it in your questions, is are the environmental impacts. The second one, obvious from Rigger's presentation, congestion. And the third one, which I don't think I will have time to talk about, but perhaps are livable cities. Because to me, if we create infrastructure in a smart way, it need not uh, have a negative impact on the environment, and it con can contribute to urban quality. This is a question of professional skill, how we do things. I'll see if I can elaborate on that in the end of this presentation. I would now like to raise a question. A question about environment, because I would like to start with environment. I think that's very important. And the question is, are increased uh, CO2 emissions a major threat to sustainable development? And when you ask a question, you wait for a response. But we don't have the time, because we are a bit squeezed in time. So I will respond to the question, yes. <laughs> You all agree, we cannot go on the way we have done. This is absolutely something that is happening now. It's a dramatic change. We need to do something dramatic. Agree? Yes. yes, wonderful. That was the wrong answer. The right answer is, well, it became all silent in the room. I'm not so sure that the response is yes, unfortunately. I think we have a dilemma here, and the dilemma is that we are not, as we hope we would be, driven by rationality and logic. We are not. Rather, we are driven by, by feelings, emotions, uh, that really triggers what we actually do. So I could turn to the speaker here and say, what will you do tonight? And he would say, well, I think I'll take the car and go to the shopping mall. They have a wonderful sale there. Or he, he might be very honest and say, I could take the bus, but you know, bus services in this town are so slow. So uh, we always find excuses for not behaving rationally, because you all agree that we cannot go on the way we do, but still we go on the way we do. You follow me? Good. Uh, the problem here is that uh, infrastructure, and especially the car, is something that is very deeply rooted in us and in our culture. In Sweden, we are talking about the car as the liberator, the enabler, the thing that, the thing that makes it possible to fulfill so many dreams. But still, we are aware of the fact that it's a threat to sustainability. Then comes the conclusion. You like my speed here. I'm, I'm trying to catch up time. Sorry for being a bit fast. Uh, no, sorry. What are the implications for planner? 
for planners. Uh, for urban planners and developers, I think that it's so essential to understand not just what people say, what they claim, but really looking at what they're actually doing, trying to see what kind of drivers people have. Uh, and based on this knowledge, we have to develop incentives to change people's behavior, make people make decisions that we consider to be sustainable. I realize that to some of you this might sound like the Soviet state that we are trying to look into the minds of people and then invent something that makes them do as we want. I'm not that Stalinistic, but I think it's essential to realize what the drives, the true drivers of people are. Now my idea was that I would show you three examples of things that were done with good intentions but went straight to hell. You know, the, the road to paradise, the, the road to hell is paved with the best of intentions. I will first show you the case of the city of Lund, which is a nice little city in the south of Sweden. It's a walkable city. It's a city with a wonderful historic downtown area. And the city is also filled with planners and politicians with very green ambitions. So they have done so much to make Lund a green city and a sustainable city. And just some features of what they've done. They have really done everything they can to promote biking. They have made so much to the environment in the city to make it walkable. They have improved public transport and they have in various ways uh, taken actions to reduce car traffic. Isn't that great? Yes, someone said yes, good. Because if, some, if you all said no, would, the whole lecture would drop dead immediately. No, this is wonderful. It's really the best of intentions to make something good. But what is happening in Lund right now? The city center is deteriorating. Services and, 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 and various public functions are decreasing in an alarming way. Why? Because people prefer to go to the low, far away located shopping malls to do both social and commercial service, fulfill commercial needs. So outside of the city center, you can see external shopping uh, uh, mushrooming and really booming while the city itself is deteriorating. Now I'm ex ex exaggerating slightly, but this is a problem that we have to realize uh, that we, people do, can behave differently from what we, we expect them to do. The second example I would have, see if I'm right here, Yes, it's a railroad strip, not a railroad strip, it's a railroad connecting two, two uh, Swedish cities uh, in the northern part of the city. Uh, the idea was to make, never mind the ideas, we skipped that. Anyway, railroad was to be constructed and what happened during the planning phase was that a number of residents, a number of bird-loving residents in one of the cities said, Hey, this railroad line is crossing straight through an area where birds are nesting. And they really made opposition to the project and said, you are really uh, devastating to these birds' possibilities to, to, to have nesting activities. You know what that is. Uh, so anyway, these protests led to a stop of the project not an internal stop, but the project was delayed for a number of years. And this could then be considered to, to be a positive environmental impact, because during these two years when the project was stopped, a number of things were done in this area, specific area where the birds were nesting in order to make it easy for them to nest, nest even though there was a railroad going through the area. The problem was that if we look at this from a a wider perspective of environment, uh, I would say that the, the success and the achievements of saving these birds were not compensated by the fact that so much of traffic was uh, taken onto the road. The whole idea, if we look at this project in retrospect, the real achievement in terms of environment is that goods transport and personal transportation is done over the rail. 
instead of car traffic, which was the only realistic options previously. So what I'm saying here is that sometimes we can focus so strongly on something that we consider to be important, like the birds, that we don't see other dimensions of, in this case, environment that are even more important, perhaps. Then my third example before I wrap this up, that's the example of the case of Horstensleden, which is hard to pronounce even in Swedish, so never mind. Uh, here we have the sailing route to Stockholm. Uh, you know, coming from the Baltic Sea, you have to pass through the archipelago before you come to Stockholm. And we have had a traditional sailing route into Stockholm, which uh, goes north in, in the archipelago. Anyway, some smart guys at the National Board for Navi uh, uh, Navigation came up with a proposal to provide us or to build a new uh, sailing route into Stockholm, and that was what was called Horstensleden. Now, a local, local, very strong local opposition awoke, and they had three very good arguments for stopping this project, really dropping it dead. First of all, it said this uh, route will harm the seashores. The waves from the big ships coming in will, will, will cause erosion, and for that reason, the project should be seen as environmentally harming. Second thing that was also made a point was that fish life, fish life would be disturbed by this new sailing route into Stockholm, quite correctly. And the third one was the negative impact on recreational life. The Stockholm archipelago is a very nice place. So this group was extremely successful and stopped the project. And my question is, should we thank them? And you realize by now that all questions would be answered in a strange way. No, we should not thank them. They were nimbys. Not in my backyard. Because all their arguments were arguments claimed to be this is general interest for the environment. General interest for the environment, for me as an urban planner, would say, what are the options? And looking at the existing uh, sailing route into Stockholm that is much more narrow it's much longer, which causes much more uh, pollution from, from oil and, and energy. And it has a larger impact on sea life, both fauna and animals. So very often we have this kind of complication where groups claim to be the advocates of public interest when they uh, really are representatives of their own uh, self-interests. So, what is my conclusion to this? My conclusion to this is that we as planners have to do a number of things. The first thing is that we have to look at in, uh, <laughs> infrastructure projects <clears throat> just like the way they are. They contain conflict. I think that Rigel's presentation is wonderful. What he presents with the bypass is a very complex project. And for some of us, it's very easy to say, we don't want that project because it will cause this kind of imp environmental impact. It's negative. Others would say we need the project because it will make it more accessible to go to Stockholm. We would decrease congestion. Uh, my professional absolutely belief is that we as planners need to be much more holistic in analyzing the project. In Riegel's presentation of the bypass, we have the environmental impacts, yes. We have the economic impacts, and we can very well calculate how much jobs and, and, and how, how we can speed up transport. But we need also to include social dimensions, and social dimensions are, of course, the fact that Stockholm, as someone said here, is an extremely segregated city. If you are living south of the city, at least in some parts, you are more or less cut off from the northern parts of the city and in the northern part of the region, I mean. And it's in the northern part of the region where jobs are available. So that kind of holistic analysis of infrastructure projects need to be the absolute minimum requirement for urban planners. And this kind of analyzing the holistic impacts of projects can be, be done on Rigert's reading example, as well as it can be applied on a local street in a local neighborhood where you consider some sort of change. We would like to bring in some commercial life. We would like to do this and that. You can always make this 
analysis of the various kinds of impact. Uh, the third, second thing here is realizing the distinction between the concepts of transport and accessibility. And I think you are mature enough to, to realize this distinction. But uh, in the backbone of many traditional planners and decision makers is the fact that, okay, we are growing. We have congestion. What should we do? We should build a new road. We should invest in infrastructure. Smart solutions. Smart infrastructure solutions means that we very often can use the existing infrastructure in a much more efficient way, which means that even though we are increasing in terms of number and transport needs, we do not need more infrastructure. Uh, then taking on the, the going on to the next item here, and that's uh, the effective project which demands both a whip and a carrot, and that's where I have to stop, unfortunately. I think it's so important to realize that when we work with this kind of, of infrastructure analysis, combining with thoughts about livable cities, sustainable cities, we need to realize that very often we have to work with both things that promote what we consider to be good behavior, important changes, but also some sort of punishment, a whip, for things that we cannot accept or things that, uh, actions that we would like to uh, make it tougher to do. And I think that once again we got a very good example here in the first presentation where, where the, the, the congestion fees in Stockholm were, were used as an example. That's one sort of example on how you can use the whip for changing behavior. But if you listen closely to that presentation, the, the important thing, lesson from Stockholm was that the whip was perhaps not enough, having these congestion charges. It was also a question of making public transport more, more accessible, more, more convenient to use. So working with these two things together is, uh, I would say, the, the, the conclusion that I come up to, to uh, and of course having this holistic perspective. 